Good morning from Miami Beach. This is Dr. John Bennett of Neurosurgical TV. Tonight, today we're honored with the uh, presence of a, a bunch of neurosurgical fellows from uh, Dr. Cato's Vegito Health University. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Alberto. Okay, Alberto, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here uh, for our third uh, webinar uh, by Fujita Health University Bantane Hospital. Uh, it's a real pleasure to meet uh, uh, well-known friends uh, and I think also today we can share some very interesting topics both about uh, tips and tricks in surgery but also on technical uh, innovations. Actually the title of our webinar today is Advances in Neurosurgery in the Modern Era. So uh, I think we can start uh, with the first panelist, which is uh, uh, Dr. Iti Chai Sakharunchai from Thailand, uh, my dear friend Iti Chai, uh, who is yeah. going to talk about the basic neurovascular anatomy in endovascular therapy. So please, uh, Iti Chai, you can start your speech. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, in my topic is uh, very basic. It's not like a uh, for modern topics, but uh, I want to uh, share about uh, the neurovascular anatomy. Uh, once we have a chance to read uh, on the, uh, cerebral angiography. And so, uh, in outline uh, for ten minutes, I will talk about the vascular anatomy about brain and spine and brain advice to arterial venous and dentarous anatomosis. As you know uh, about the uh, aortic art we devised from the, the right side to the left side of the art from vacuocephalic trunk, left common thoracic artery and left vertebral artery. What you can see about the uh, angiogram or aortogram like in slide. So if we need to select by, use the, by using the microcatheter, so we need to know about the uh, anatomy of this vessel. So now we have many catheter shapes that we can select to the uh, selected artery that we want to know. In this case, uh, the right uh, common the left common cathetic artery arises right. from the right side. That means this is what we call the bovine arch. So we call one for uh, angiography when we perform about the selection. So uh, the subcaven artery they also have the many branches of the artery that we should know about the tyrosol cervical trunk cortical cervical trunk, or this artery is connect to the uh, vertebral artery or uh, internal cerebral artery that I will mention later. First step of the selection of the art, we just uh, start in the right side, then we just move the catheter to select the another band, like a start from the right vertebral artery, then go to the right common carotid artery and go to the uh, left um, common carotid artery and left vertebral artery. So for common carotid artery, when we see about the AP view, the cause of ICR at the first time is can cause from the uh, uh, lateral then go to the medial It's the opposite from the ECA that from uh, go to uh, lateral side for the lateral view we can see about the common uh, for the bifurcation of the common church artery it start around the c3 and c4 of cervical spine so when we select it we just uh, know about the anatomy if we put the catheter from the lateral view of the angiography in the front it uh, should be the external carotid artery. We can see many branches like an occipital artery, a facial artery, like this. And the ICA, this is uh, 
behind the ECA and go to uh, the p touch part. But they have the two curves we should recognize. The first one, this is a, a, P, a P touch part, and the second one is a, a, a Kavanat part. So uh, this is uh, the location or uh, uh, the segment of the ICA that we know before. Many segments that related to anatomical and the branch that's arrived from the ICA. And this case, I, I want to uh, recognize the optimic artery can divide the part of intracranial artery and extracranial artery for, uh, from the ICA. And the, uh, uh, from the optimic artery, we can uh, notice that the branch, uh, the opposite side of the optimic artery and slightly higher is a PCOM, then it's an anterior corridor artery. If we select it, you use the tongue view, and we need to uh, smooth as you like a tie away. So this is a prevent spasm or dissection. So for intracranial branches, yes, we can see the AP view. The rental cross sided artery is arising along the A1 and M1. And the M2 and M3 is uh, located around the Lyman insula and operculum. That's mean. For the ACA, we can uh, divide to A2, A3, and A4. They have many uh, uh, about the names that are specific to each artery. If we can uh, remember or bind, this is very, uh, very good when we can uh, interpret about the, uh, the treatment planning or the complication related that brand can occur. So in this picture, you can see about the choroidal part, that means this is uh, for uh, le le retinal artery. If they have some brand anatomosis from the outside to inside, it's really when the patient have to uh, experience to inject about the Botox. They have some events occur like a, a retrograde to the choroidal blood and make it uh, the patient uh, bright or lost about the VA. This is the most important. This case also, this is a PCOM, and you see that, mean that I mentioned before is the opposite of the optimic artery. So another brand is from meningo hypophysic trunk and ILG. I will go fast because the time is very short. Our presentation, we should devise arterial phase, capillary phase, and venous phase. This is uh, have the benefits to interpret about once we uh, perform the balloon test occlusion. When we compare the both sides, that uh, the occluded side, if delay about the V nut phase more than two seconds compared to the normal side, that means not enough flow. We should not sacrifice this aneurysm. The external credit artery, they have edge bond, as you know before, but the most uh, dangerous anatomosis allowed uh, allowed here. That can can you see about this or uh, uh, arrow side? This means the middle medial artery can anatomosis to the ICA. If once we have to embolize this band, so the embolic material can go to the ICA and uh, it can cause stroke or retrograde to the optimic artery. The patient have the, some problem about the visual acuity. This is the most important side about uh, anatomosis. So if we need to embolize some tumor around here, it's very, uh, should avoid about this uh, anatomosis to the ICA and the optimic artery. For another anatomosis for the uh, cervical, as I mentioned before, it can connect to VA. Yeah, it says can have some problem once we uh, occlude about the cervical artery. And this band, as you familiar about this band, I just pass it quickly. And 
we can see about the impingement mark around here. So for the uh, posterior meningeal artery can arise from the vertebral artery, can supply the posterior dura. And they have the anatomosis from SCA, IGA, and PIGA around here. Once some branch have occluded, another branch can help to supply from the occluded side. So this picture, once we have subaronal hemorrhage around a pontine area, this is adequate for cerebral angiography. It's not adequate because we can see only about the opposite, uh, opposite side of the right VA. We should perform uh, the right VA to clear for the whole view of the pica, right pica, that can represent about the subaronal hemorrhage. That means you know about the cause subaronal hemorrhage. Yeah, you have come from many diseases. So, so protocol for cerebral angiography for subaronal hemorrhage, we should perform both, uh, uh, both common carotid artery and both VA like this. So I will script to the we we not study. We not study that me we uh, see about the superior and deep venous system that you know before. But if we want to study about the posterior uh, uh vein venous system, we should perform from the vertebral artery system. We can see the posterior fossa vein. So if we want to study about the venous, we should perform several angiogram both ICA and both VA. So, and hydrocephalus, we can see from the uh, lenticular uh, thoramosal artery. Is if the angle is uh, uh, it's not sharp, it's more than 60 degree, we can imply that this patient has some problem about the uh, hydrocephalus. So for the conclusion, if we want to examine the subrenal hemorrhage, we should perform both common artery and both VA. For dural AV fistula, don't forget to select both ECA and both VA. So we have, uh, it's have like a dural, dural brand. Or another AVM, you know, we maybe we can study for whole uh, cerebral angiography because they have some uh, brand to cross about the territory to supply the AVM nidus. Another uh, I script about the spinal artery because uh, the time is limit. So okay, this is my topic in today. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Itichai Sakarun Chai, for okay. this very nice presentation about uh, uh, vascular anatomy. Uh, is there any question uh, from the other participants? Uh, hello, this is Dr. Aravan from India. Yes. Uh, Dr. Iti Chai, uh, like good that for subarachnoid hemorrhages, we had a very good explanation from you that which vessels should be included in the angiogram. Yeah. Suppose we have a subarachnoid hemorrhage on only one side of the sylvian fissure. Mm -hmm. Still, would you want to do an angio of all vessels? Uh, if we uh, suspected the aneurysm in that side, okay, we can perform just only one side. But if we don't know, like a uh, diffuse subarachnoid hemorrhage, but we, can, we could not see from the CTA previously, so you should exclude another disease, especially dural AV fistula or AVM that can cause subrenal hemorrhage at the same. But uh, uh, if but uh, if you perform both ICA, if uh, if you suspect that in the right side, you should perform in the left side also because it's a planning for treatment. Once you have occluded some brand from the left side, you can see about the anatomosis from the contralateral side. You can predict about the outcome once you have some complication during treatment by endovascular treatment, especially from ACOM or from PCOM. Okay. 
Yes. Yes, thank you. Okay. My pleasure. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I see Dr. Tien has a question. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Uh, uh, yes. 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 Do you only perform the GSA to femoral or radian approach? Thank you. Uh, femoral approach. I always femoral use a femoral approach. Okay. It's very really easy. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I think uh, uh, we sh should go on. Next speaker is Dr. Riccardo Stanzani from Italy. His topic uh, is correlation between CFD and intraoperative findings in unruptured MCA bifurcation aneurysms. So please, uh, Riccardo, you can uh, start your topic. Thank you. I'm trying to share my screen. Okay, can you see? Yes, it's good. Okay, okay. Thank you, everybody. Good morning, and thank you for joining this meeting. My name is uh, Riccardo Santani, and I'm a fifth year resident in neurosurgery from Italy, and a previous professor, Cato Fellow, whom I thank for the kind invitation. Today, as Alberto told to us, I want to talk with you about the correlation between uh, computational flight dynamics, CFD, and uh, intraoperative findings in uh, unruptured MCA bifurcation algorithm. With uh, CFD software, after building a computational volumetric mesh from uh, CT angio images, we can run algorithms that use uh, the Navistock equation to simulate blood flow on the computational mesh. In this way, we can obtain different parameters, the pressure at the aneurysm wall, the pressure variation at the aneurysm wall, the wall shear stress, the wall shear stress, the um, OS index, and the vector diversification. On PubMed, we can find a lot of paper about CFD and intracranial aneurysm, most of them trying to correlate the CFD parameters and the aneurysm risk of rupture. But as we well know, aneurysm risk of rupture may also be influenced by other factors, like, for example, genetics and personal risk factors. So the role of CFD to define the aneurysm risk of raptor is still not clear at all. At the same time, some authors investigate the potential ability of CFD to provide information about the structural characteristic of the aneurysm. And that can be a very valuable tool during the treatment of aneurysm, both surgical and endovascular treatment. We all know that intraoperative we can find the three kinds of walls thin red wall, like this one, a normal wall, and a thick atherosclerotic wall. So what we think? We think that a thin red wall is related with medium high pressure and pressure variation, a diversification of vector, an higher OS index, and a lower WSS. In a normal wall, we can find a medium or medium low pressure and pressure variation, parallel vector, lower OS index, and medium high WSS. In a thick atherosclerotic wall, we can find a medium low pressure, convergent vector like this, higher OS index, and medium WSS. To verify our hypothesis, we analyzed a ruptured MCA bifurcation algorithm created from January 2019 to December 2019 at Neurosurgical Department of Fujita Health University, Bantane Hospital in Nagoya, Japan. We reviewed the intraoperative video and checked the CFD analysis and parameters of 21 patients with 21 aneurysms. We identified 30 areas of interest. 14 are thin red walls, 12 are normal wall and 4 are thick atherosclerotic wall. For each one, we evaluated the following CFD parameters, pressure, pressure variation, WSS, OS index, and vector diversification. I don't know why this blue one, sorry. Okay, okay. 
And uh, every, we can see here the average of the parameters collected for each kind of wall. We can see that uh, thin red wall has a higher pressure and pressure variation and lower WSS. We can see also that the thick atherosclerotic wall has the higher value of medium value of um, OS index and a different partner uh, of vector diversification for each group. We perform a statistical analysis and we use the t-test for the comparison of mean values for continuous data and the Fisher exact test for the comparison of categorical data. We can see that we found an higher pressure variation that significant correlate with the red thin wall. At the same time, an IOS index significant correlate with the red thin wall and thick catherosclerotic wall. Divergent vector significant correlate with the red thin wall and the convergent vector significant correlate with thick catherosclerotic wall. So we can say that in our series, in our experience, an high pressure variation, an high OS index, and the divergent vectors significant correlate with the um, interoperative finding of a thin red wall. And an high OS index with convergent vectors correlate with thick atherosclerotic wall. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Ricardo, uh, for this nice presentation. Um, is there any question by participants of this meeting? Otherwise, I, I have a question. Um, yeah. Of course, CFD is very uh, intriguing method to try to uh, predict uh, how an aneurysm will uh, behave over time. Uh, and there are some contrasting results in the literature, uh, yeah. as we know. That's true. And probably, uh, also, inflammation of the wall of the aneurysm is uh, part of this process. So, uh, do you have any uh, data, any experience, or any project uh, in trying to match uh, CFD data with uh, uh, histopathological uh, findings uh, on aneurysm yeah. walls? There's something that introduced a colleague, an Indian colleague, Dr. Devaredi that was in uh, Nagoya when, when I was uh, here. And uh, we, he's trying to correlate the CFD parameters with uh, the histopathological uh, findings by obtaining a portion of the aneurysm sac when, you can, uh, you, when we can cut the, the aneurysm during the, the surgery. It, uh, it will be a long work because we need a high number of specimens and uh, not always you can cut the sac at the end of the surgery, but it's something that uh, we want to, to do. We are, we are trying to do this. And at the same time, I think that uh, the results in the literature are not, uh, not the same in, in the different center because uh, there's too much software that you, we can use uh, for uh, obtaining CFD parameters, not only one software in the world. And at the same time, maybe there's something to do to obtain better algorithms uh, with the Navistock equation. I think these two, these two things are uh, something that we have to work in the yeah, future. Probably, yeah, that it's a very uh, interesting technique, but probably many variables still. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I agree. So if there are no other questions, uh, Arvind. Next speaker will be Dr. Anton from Russia and uh, his topic will be microsurgical treatment for posterior circulation aneurysms in the endovascular. Yeah, hi everyone. It's nice to see you here. It's my first time in a webinar with you. Not the last one, I hope. So let's start with the talk. The topic for today is the microsurgical treatment of posterior circulation aneurysm. It's a tricky one thing, so I would like to introduce also my colleagues, the Yuri Pilkenk and Shalvay Lava, who is my mentors, and help me with this topic. So let's begin. As everybody knows, uh, it's a kind of 15% of all aneurysm in posterior circulation aneurysm. 
which we're dealing with. So uh, we have to divide them for three groups, um, depending on the localization. So it helps us to uh, plan the surgery, the approach, and the outcome of the surgery. So also to uh, select the method of uh, whether it is endovascular or microsurgical. So it's upper third, uh, middle third, and lower third. So let's look for standard techniques of microsurgery. Uh, we use uh, sometimes the orbital zygomatic approach for upper level. So we can reach the basilar tip aneurysm, the SCA aneurysm, sometimes the PCA, uh, proximal um, uh, origin aneurysm, and so on. So here is the, some examples of our work. So you can see the huge aneurysm with the fusiform shape. The four arteries originate from the aneurysm dome, so it's not the nice one for endovascular treatment. And it also has the SAH, so kind of the uh, tricky case. Sorry for that. Yeah, this is the video. Uh, you can see the aneurysm clipping, and it's uh, mandatory to preserve the perforators, which one can go uh, on the bottom of the aneurysm. So it's kind of the really tricky to preserve the perforators if you do the coiling. Uh, so the, sometimes the microsurgery, microsurgery is the treatment of the choice for such kind of aneurysm. We also use the subtemporal approach or different combinations of terrenal and subtemporal at the one time. So it's kind of the combined approach. So you can reach the upper and sometimes the middle third of the basilar trunk uh, artery localization aneurysm. So uh, sometimes uh, you can use the trans uh, petrosal uh, approach, kind of the Kavasi approach. Uh, also, we use the retrosigmoid approach. It's kind of the workers approach for uh, pica aneurysm, which is the distal one, not the distal pica, but the distal vertebral. And also you can reach the trunk of the basilar. Here is the kind of, um, the transcondylar modification for the posterior lateral approaches, which can be used for um, the vertebral basal junction and also for pica, uh, and also the paralateral approach. So here is the um, uh, one more example of the ventral localized uh, uh, basal junction aneurysm. Uh, you can see the penetration of the basal region, and it's not the suitable one for endovascular. So we did it microsurgical with the paralateral approach. So you can see the dura opening, the approach for cistern and proximal uh, vertebral. Here is the temporal clipping, and you can see the dome of the aneurysm and the clipping of the dome. So it's ruptured from the first clips, but it's still okay because we can put one more clip on the neck. So here is the second clip. And it stopped bleeding. So uh, the outcome angiographically is here. It's a total, uh, um, it's a radical treatment. So the patient did well. And uh, also we can use the uh, mid suboccipital approach for uh, vertebral arteries aneurysm, and uh, here is the example of uh, distal pica aneurysm, which is kind of in cisternal segment of the pica. So you can see the fusiform aneurysm, and even we cannot perform uh, the direct clipping of the aneurysm, we can perform the opening of the uh, aneurysm, though, reject it, and remodel the uh, vessel with the clipping technique. So sometimes it's useful and we can do this. Uh, here is the angiographical control. So you can see the patency of the artery and everything is fine. Also we can do the, some kind of uh, 
distal types of vertebral fusiform aneurysm with that approach. So here is an example. Uh, you can see how it's difficult to approach the aneurysm because of the uh, So you can be careful in this type of surgery all the time. So here is the temporal clipping of the vertebral and putting the final clip on the aneurysm. Uh, actually, we can do the revascularization for this type of aneurysm in posterior circulation. We, I would not go deep in this theme, but I will show some cases. Here's the fusiform uh, aneurysm of the pica. Uh, you can see the origin of the pica and the fusiform aneurysm. So we did the uh, reposition of the pica. So we clip the proximal, uh, distal um, origin of the pica at the aneurysm and cut off the uh, distal part and re-implanted in the distal part, in the proximal part, I'm sorry. So you can see the anastomosis in situ here. It works well and uh, here is the control. So the patient did well after the surgery. And also you can do the occipital, uh, you can do the in situ type side-to-side uh, -side bypass and different types of occipital artery uh, like um, microanastomosis for vertebral and pica. So here's the case of the combination of the uh, surgeries like microsurgery and endovascular. Here's the fusiform two uh, double type of the aneurysm here with the 20 year, 12 years old uh, patient. So you can see the mass lesion here like the fusiform, uh, huge giant aneurysm. And the pica is originating from the one of the uh, aneurysm. Uh, here is the small um, connection between the aneurysms. So it's kind of the fusiform and it's not suitable for endovascular treatment at first. So uh, you can also see the thrombosis of the, the biggest part and the patient started to decline in the neurologically. So we decided to go for microsurgical uh, clipping one of one of the biggest part. So you can see the vertebral, the biggest uh, aneurysm here. So we tried to find the distal part of the connection and revascularize, uh, revascularize the uh, pica with the septal artery here. So we can uh, trap the biggest part of the aneurysm and uh, be careful with the pica so it's uh, revascularized and you can see the control here. So we trapped it and did the thrombectomy and decompressed the brain stem. So patient started to improve. You can see the trapping of the aneurysm uh, and here is the patient. And then later, uh, later on, uh, so we performed uh, the endovascular stent placement uh, in the uh, second uh, part of the treatment, like in two months, we implant the pipeline here and you can see the result. Here's the pipeline, here is the trapped aneurysm with the revascularized pipeline. So the patient uh, is nice. So discussion for this topic is kind of uh, what we should do with the acute period of ACH. So here's the nice paper. Uh, which is the new one from the Barrow trial. Uh, you can see that uh, the uh, long-term outcome of the clipping is kind of the better than the coiling. So it's 10 years after the uh, Brad trial. And uh, you can see that the clipping is 93% uh, of radical treatment versus 21, uh, 22 for endovascular and some kind of endovascular surgery limitations. So it's atherosclerosis, some perforating adverse origin from the aneurysm, sometimes not uh, the relief, the see the tumor clinical presentation in the mass effect of the aneurysm if it's giant, some kind of fusiform configuration and multiple pathologies. Like if we have the aneurysm and we go for endovascular and dual antiplatelet therapy and the patient has a tumor, we cannot go for a tumor removal because he has the uh, troubles with the hemostasis. So it's kind of the tricky case. So thank everyone for attention and 
I'm ready for any questions and thanks so much for the opportunity to speak. Okay, thank you, Anton, for your very nice presentation and impressive cases, actually. Uh, any question from other people? Uh, yeah, I would like to have a question to Dr. Itichai, if he's still available. Uh, Itichai, yes, I think he is connected. Uh, Itichai? Professor Itichai? Okay, maybe he okay. is not. <laughs> Never mind. It's okay. Yeah, so uh, I just wanted so to have his opinion, opinion because yeah, I know he does a lot of endovascular work. Uh, yeah, yes. So, uh, I can 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 you hear me? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, Itichai, we uh, hear yeah, you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, uh, Doctor Itichai. Uh, yes. I, I just, my question to you is, like, uh, how many, how much, uh, what is the incidence of perforator compromise you would see in endovascular cases for posterior circulation and neurisms? Mm. Do you mean about a uh, uh, complication or compromise for? Yeah, yeah, complications, complications of perforator, perforator compromise. Ah, oh, oh yeah, yeah. But uh, uh, I I will talk about the four four diverters then because this is the most modern device that we can use. Is even the the try is that no no uh no support about the using the four diverter stand in posterior circulation but in my uh, in my experience uh, we uh, have a few cases of uh, perforator uh, occlusion after we put about the stand along the uh, basilar artery or vertebral artery but i think the perforator uh, uh, is uh, no, no, have a uh, the big chance to occlude. I think the flow, some, some flow, and can through, uh, and and flow through the stent. Yeah, but we can pre preserve it even we use the stent. But uh, if we use the two stent together, this is the big problems because two stent together. It can cause the, the major deficits from the perforating artery or cushion from the posterior circulation. But I think it's a good outcome by endovascular treatment in this era. Yes. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Konovalov, maybe I missed uh, the information. Uh, what, what's the rate of uh, endovascular treatment versus uh, microsurgical treatment for posterior circulation aneurysms in your institution? It's kind of 90% uh, for posterior circulation and for endovascular. We do like 10% for complicated cases uh, for we go for microsurgical. Hello, I'm uh, Sandeep Kumar from India, currently at Bantanit for fellowship here. I will talk about Flow 800 today. So flow is used in anonymous surgery, AVM bypass, and humor surgery. Today I will talk about only the uh, role of AVM in uh, role of uh, flow in AVM surgery. The first article was published in uh, 2011 regarding the use of flow 800. This software is currently available microscope Pentero and Kino 900 microscopes. Indocyan green is most commonly used for some molecules since 1959. ICG VA become popular. And it is used in cerebral vascular surgery since 2003 and in AVM resection since 2007 by integrating optical technology into optical microscope. The limitation of VA is that it provides information about the vessel anatomy in the surgical field but not about the hemodynamics within the blood vessel. Due to the lack of this objectivity, uh, the new software Flow 800 was introduced in 2011, which can provide a semi quantitative data by generating color maps. Uh, from the fluorescent intensity obtained from ICGVA. Advantage of this is it provides uh, real time evaluation. Results are reproducible, practical, and ease of uh, intraoperative interpretation. It helps in safe surgical resection and preservation of uninvolved angio architecture. In AVM surgery, it can differentiate the feeding artery from the 
dry, dry inner and uninvolved passage vessels. It helps to understand the flow dynamics within the AVM and guide through each step of AVM excision and helps to ensure complete resection of the NIDIS. After ICG VA, the flow aided software produces color coded maps in 30 to 40 seconds. Uh, the surgeon can choose the region of interest over the vessel in different colors following the following the software points in the diagram. Interpretation arteries will appear red, veins will, veins appear blue, and arterial vein will appear yellow or orange. This is an example of a flow intensity diagram provided by the flow aided software. Then this intensity diagram we can check for few parameters like delay. Delay is the uh, time interval for 0 to 50 percent of the for the intensity and uh, rise time is the time interval for 0 to 90 percent of maximum fluorescent intensity and time to peak is the appearance of fluorescence till it reaches the maximum fluorescent intensity. So these parameters we have to check at every stage of the surgery uh, and this will help in resection of AVM and understand the flow dynamics during AVM resection but still this flow it, it is not without limitations. It since it depend on direct elimination, subcortical components of AVM cannot be visualized, and so it's not good for deep thread AVM. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kumar, for your presentation. Any question? So I, I have the feeling that uh, Flow 800 uh, is very uh, useful for AVMs, as you showed. Yeah. But I'm not very confident it has any meaning with uh, any reason surgery. I don't know if you, any of you have an opinion about uh, about this. Some people claim the Flow 800 is useful also for any reasons, but I don't know how it can be useful. I see uh, it is very useful for AVMs, but uh, I'm asking if any of you have any experience uh, of Flow 800 uh, with any reasons. Uh, I would like to it's share the same view with Dr. Felity uh, because uh, most of the times after clipping, if you want to assess the flow in the proximal and distal or uh, any branching vessel, most of the times it so happens that the clip we place occludes the uh, vessels in vision so uh, most of the times it so happens that we could have a better idea before clipping but to compare it with after clipping regarding the vessels parent and distal vessel i do think it is a little bit difficult okay any other comment i i have uh, another question uh, yes regarding for for night uh, for 800 is really good uh, about the microscope software, but I want to know what, how much the maximum of the ICG where we can use it in one operation. Because uh, if we perform the AVM surgery in one case, so we, we, uh, we can apply many times of ICG, but I want to know how many times or the maximum as how much milligram that we can use this? Can I ask Dr. Kumar? Uh, there is no restriction like that. The only thing is, uh, till the time it takes to clear from the body. As, as we all know, it clears very rapidly from the body. So we can use it as many times as we want. There is no limitation. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Aravind. Uh, now with the next speaker, we have Dr. Milesh Garg from India. So he'll be talking to us on combined endovascular, supraorbital, and middle temporal gyrus approach for extensive medial temporal glioma. Dr. Milesh, hello. Hello. Am I audible? Yeah, you are. You can go ahead. Uh, the screen can be seen. Yeah. 
Yes, we can see. You can make it bigger. Okay. There you go. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'll be presenting about a unique approach which we applied in our case uh, when I was in Bandani Hospital for my fellowship about a case uh, which is uh, which was a 65-year-old male who presented with seizures to us and a patient was no, having no neurological deficits. The CT scan was done which was suggestive of an extensive lesion, uh, a hypodense area in the uh, right temporal uh, lobe which was extending to suprasellar as well as infratentular region. In the CT scan you can see the uh, brainstem was also rotated medially as well as posteriorly. MRI brain was done which was suggestive of uh, a, uh, in P2 image uh, this was suggestive of hyper intense uh, lesion in the right temporal lobe which was extending to suprasellar as well as infratentorial lobe, infratentorial region. The PCOM artery and PC artery were also uh, traversing through the tumor and MCA was also traversing through the tumor. Uh, the T1 contrast image was suggestive of uh, 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 no contrast enhancement. The, the DTA was suggestive of uh, the pyramidal uh, tract pushed medially as well as superiorly. Uh, so, just one second. So, before uh, we planned our approach, uh, just uh, we decided to go ahead and find out the literature. What are the options which are available? Uh, the options which were available uh, were. Uh, Transylvian, uh, subtemporal, subcortical, as well as endoscopic. There are various advantages and disadvantages associated with each and every approach. The Transylvian approach was uh, mainly associated with vascular injuries, as well as uh, uh, subtemporal approaches have got uh, in which we need to retract the temporal lobes, as well as uh, they have got limited working space and there are chances of damage to the vein of labi. Whereas the Subcortical approach are need larger craniotomies and dissection of temporalis muscle. Uh, the endoscopic advantages have got, uh, the approaches have got advantages of minimally invasive, being better illumination and panoramic view. So we discussed these advantages as well as disadvantages with the patient and the relative. And, but certain tumors or certain lesions, they require multiple approaches. So, we decided to go ahead and do endoscopic approach in this patient but this tumor was so extensive that it could not be removed with a single approach so we decided and go ahead and use endoscopic approach through the supraorbital keyhole area as well as through the temporal area through the middle temporal gyrus using a view side brain access system so this is the position of the patient uh, and our incision marks you could see uh, the incision was extending from the supraorbital notch uh, uh, on the right side towards laterally up to the margin of the eyebrows. Uh, the frontalis muscle as well as corrugator supercilia and temporalis muscle were retracted, dissected and uh, uh, a small burr hole was made over at the margin of the, uh, over the keyhole area and uh, the craniotomy of around 3 into 1 centimeter was made. Uh, on opening the dura, the frontal lobe was retracted and we were able to visualize the tumor in the subfrontal area as well as supracellar area. The tumor in the subfrontal area was dissected and uh, removed with the help of suction because the tumor was soft and uh, soft in consistency. We were able to easily remove and dissect the tumor. Uh, after removal of the tumor from the subfrontal area, we were able to visualize the right optic nerve, right ICA, and we were able to remove the tumor from the optico carotid as well as carotico oculomotor cisterns. Uh, and simultaneously, another set of neurosurgeon team was operating through the temporal side. A curvilinear incision was uh, made from in front of the tragus, going superiorly and posteriorly over the temporal area. Uh, the temporalis fascia was dissected and with the help of navigation guidance, we marked the site of our craniotomy and a small craniotomy of around 2.5 to 3 centimeter was made under navigation guidance. Uh, the dura was opened over the middle temporal gyrus in the uh, curvilinear fashion and a small 
dichotomy of around 2.5 uh, 1.5 cm size was made over the middle temporal gyrus a view side brain access system was inserted and this is our or setup with the two set of neurosurgeons operating simultaneously the keyhole surgeon operating over the keyhole area and another surgeon was operating through the uh, temporal lobe over the middle temporal gyrus using the view side brain access system so this is through the view side brain access system uh, the view side you can see it's a totally transparent uh, uh, instrument which is uh, made up of uh, carbolic uh, stuff you can see the temporal lobe uh, uh, clearly through it and the tumor which was dissected and sucked after removal of the tumor from the sub, uh, from the temporal lobe we were able to visualize the tentorium the tentorium was then uh, coagulated and uh, it was cut uh, it was cut behind the uh, fourth cranial nerve the tumor uh, in the infra tentorial region was again dissected and removed in bits and pieces under navigation guidance and this is at the end of the procedure through that side the closer part and this is the post op ct uh, the midbrain which was uh, being pushed uh, medially as well as posteriorly came back to its uh, normal place and the gross total resection of the tumor was done this is our patient which was uh, having no neurological deficit in the post op period uh, now coming to the discussion part why we specifically used endoscopy in this particular patient because endoscope has got better illumination better visualization and panoramic view uh, it needs a small access corridor regardless of the tumor size whereas in microscope we need to have a uh, access corridor which depends upon the size of the tumor uh, we didn't have to use any retracted device in this whereas in microscope retracted device is usually used uh, but the, there are various advantages of microscope over endoscope also which we need to take into consideration depending upon the case to case like there is no blind area in case of microscope there is a blind there is a blind area behind the instruments in case of endoscope uh, the orientation does not change in microscope whereas in endoscope we have to uh, make sure that uh, we have to hold the instruments properly camera properly so that the orientation does not change and there is a very small space in endoscope uh, uh, which uh, endoscopic view which usually gets obstructed while we are using the instruments so this is again a pictorial representation of uh, the uh, size of the craniotomy or size of our approach uh, there are various advantages of view side brain access system which also i have mentioned uh, like it does not adhere to the brain tissue there are clear walls which visualize uh, which allow visualization of the surrounding structures elliptical ports allow bimanual dexterity the there are bevel tips which allow refined placement during surgery it, it is a tubular shaped uh, instrument which e allows even distribution of pressure into the retracted brain tissue to minimize the trauma the distal open there is a distal opening in the interducer which allows access of csf and blood to flow through the uh, its insertion sites uh, it is made up of non conductive material which is important when using a electrocautery during tumor resection uh, the distal opening at the end does not reflect light which is very important like in many retractors uh, the distal opening reflects light so it does not allow the the surgeon to observe the tumor surface as well as vessels in that area so there are chances of vascular injury and normal brain tissue in that case so which is avoided in this and uh, these are uh, the locations which can be accessed assist uh, after supraorbital craniotomies that was regarding the view side brain access system so the different regions which can be seen by view side uh, the by supraorbital craniotomy ipsilateral or orbital roof cranial 1 2 3 4 anterior and posterior cranial processes roof and lateral wall of cavernous sinus basal frontal lobe gyrus rectus sylvian fissure anterior medial temporal lobe uh, then these vessels can also be seen in the midline crista galli olfactory groove planum sphenoidal tuberculum cellae lamina terminalis anterior third ventricle pituitary stalk and interpeduncular fossa a a anterior communicating artery distal basilar artery and perforators can be seen very well through this so the indications of using supraorbital keyhole are uh, aneurysms of the anterior circulation except that of distal anterior cerebral artery as well as it, it 
should not be used in uh, uh, anterior acom artery which is aneurysm which is projecting posteriorly as well as superiorly and as well as the aneurysms which are beyond the genu this will not be visualized mc aneurysms so for high position basilar bifurcation and basilar superior cerebral artery aneurysms tumors of the anterior cranial fossa and sphenoid ridge pathologies of the cella and supracellular region also so coming to the advantages of our approach per se is it lead to small operative wound the operative duration was also very small compared to such a large tumor which require in craniotomy uh, in microsurgical approach is usually required 5 to 6 hours we were able to complete the operation within 3 hours there was no intraoperative blood transfusion there was rare occurrence of post operative epidural hematoma usually in this particular case because the, the craniotomy is small there is at least to negligible damage of temporalis muscle less wound related pain and early return to work in normal life and but there are various disadvantages which we have to take into consideration like uh, there is a long learning curve it is difficult to remove uh, heart tumors with this particular approach there is a reduced maneuverability of the instruments because of the small space and risk of prolonged or permanent palsy of frontalis muscle if the incision uh, extends in case uh, to more than one to three centimeters so we have to make sure that the incision line should be in the uh, eyebrow in the eyebrow or just above that it should not go beyond thank you very much any questions so yes i have a question uh, you mentioned about uh, well uh, congratulations for the very nice uh, operations you showed uh, you mentioned about uh, the learning curve. Actually, I, I am, as a uh, person who likes uh, neuroendoscopy, I would really like to know how long does it take uh, to a surgeon to, to get the experience to remove uh, tumors uh, in this way. And second question uh, is related to um, more hard tumors which is actually more difficult to remove. Do you, do you also use uh, ultrasound aspiration, aspiration or what other tricks would you suggest to, to remove uh, such kind of tumors? Uh, sir, I'll answer the second question first because the ultrasound aspirator, usually if the tumor is hard or firm, ultrasound aspirator would be required. Uh, but in our case, uh, we specifically opted for this approach because the tumor, uh, we were suspecting it to be uh, soft rather than firm, rather than hard in consistency. So we need not require ultrasound respirator in our case. But if the tumor is hard, it is going to take uh, the use of ultrasound respirator. And regarding the first question, uh, uh, it takes a long, uh, long learning curve, especially I think Dr. Vijay Parihar is also online. Uh, he'll be able to answer because Dr. Vijay Parihar is uh, from uh, Jabalpur uh, Medical College in uh, India. So he is uh, very well experienced and his whole center is doing a lot of neuroendoscopy. So this was a very unique case uh, which was done at Bantane Hospital when I was posted over there during my uh, fellowship. So uh, there are experts in each and every field as you know. So I suppose he'll be a better person to answer. Dr. Vijay? Are you able to hear us? Dr. Parihar? Vijay? Not listening? So, okay, maybe we can ask uh, his. Okay, he's here, I think. No? No, he's not able to hear. No, not here. Okay, maybe he can comment later about this. But it, uh, take, it does take a long learning curve because. Uh, uh, as far as what I have seen, uh, uh, there are different people in different fields who are expert in their own particular field. So, uh, so it probably will take three to four years to get trained in a particular uh, neuroendoscopy doing keyhole as well as view side brain access system. If one is, uh, and we need to have cases, a lot of cases to, if so that is very important. Thank you. So I believe, much. I believe, I believe. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Other, other questions to Dr. Nilesh? We are going to speak about the 
tips and tricks during the rupture of ECOM and you read intraoperatively. Uh, first of all, we have when dealing with ruptured ECOM aneurysm to see first what is the time of surgery. Some surgeons prefer early surgery, some pre person prefer late surgery. I, I prefer late surgery because we have a relaxed brain, there is no vasospasm, but there is an advantage that there may be an incidence of re bleeding. About early surgery, it will be like the brain is very edematous, but we will prevent vasospasm and we will prevent the bleeding. This is the direction of ACOM aneurysm. It may be like superior, anterior, superior, inferior projection, and we will talk about each one. In dealing with anterior projection aneurysm, the most important thing is to avoid excessive retraction on the frontal lobe to avoid premature bleeding. Can you hear me? No? Yeah. But the most important thing is dealing with the perforator. This aneurysm is very easy in getting the vascular tree A1, A2, hubner, bilateral hubner, and bilateral A1 and 2, but if not dealing with the perforator, the patient will come with a severe deficit. So I always say that surgery is mainly surgery of the perforators, not with the main vascular tree. In casing with the superior projection aneurysm, the, the problem is in the contralateral A2. So you can first get the epsilateral A1, epsilateral A2, hubner, contralateral A1 and ECOM, but sometimes you will not see the contralateral A2 until you put a pilot clip. And I will put a video at the end of this talk to see how we can deal with this case. The inferior projection aneurysm, it is very important to know which part is the dominant side, whether the left or right A1, and you go from the dominant side. But I always prefer to go from the right A1, from the right dominant Right dominant, the, the right the, uh, the right side, right perineal approach from the right side. We use many different approaches, but I always go through the perineal approach. But I use the interhemispheric or orbital orbit zygomatic approach if I'm going to deal with giant ECOM aneurysm, or if there is a possibility of doing a bypass. Studying of the preoperative images is very important to know the projection of the aneurysm, which. A1 is the dominant one, and if there is any associated hydrocephalus to put VP shunt or whether external brain. The anesthesia, I always say that the anesthesia is 50% of the operation, especially in ruptured ECOM aneurysm. The brain must be relaxed, otherwise, you will not be able to operate. You must talk with the anesthesiologist you, before the operation and always. Tell him that during, if premature rupture occurs and you put a temporary clip, he has to elevate the blood pressure. Which side do you go, right or left side? Many surgeons always go through the dominant side, whether it is left or right, but I always prefer to go from the right side because I, first I'm a right-handed surgeon. The right frontal lobe is much more forgiving than the left frontal lobe. The left frontal lobe, there is the broccus area there, and if any edema happens or anything occurs, the patient will become a physic. So I always go through the right side. The most difficult thing in going through the right side when the aneurysm is projected inferiorly, so you will go through the hypoplastic side of the axilateral A1. The most difficult one is to get the contralateral A1 if premature rupture occurs. But if this occurs, we're going to see how can we deal with it. I always go the patient is put in an extended position with still from 15 to 20 degrees. I always prepare when dealing with ruptured aneurysm. The most important thing is proximal control, is to get proximal control before rupture. As long as you get a proximal control before you get the aneurysm, the aneurysm surgery is very easy. I always prepare by two suction tubes. I identify the ipsilateral and contralateral A1 first. 
competent assistant is very important because he is your third hand when the premature rupture occurred. Competent anesthesiologist to elevate the blood pressure. Temporary clips are available and always use lilac tractors. This is like um, an annulus projected superiorly and a little bit anteriorly. The dominant side is the left side. This is like I always put the images like if I'm going right terional, he like if I'm going, this is the carotid, the ipsilateral A1, ipsilateral A2, here is the A comp, and here is the contralateral A1 and contralateral A2, and he's, and we go, and I will present a video of this case. I always go through the right side although the dominant is from the left side the right optic right carotid i always use a jewelry forceps and micro scissors for dissection of the arachnoid this case is operated in the fourth day after bleeding the bifurcation i get the bifurcation and the ipsilateral a1 which is the not dominant and always get the if it if it is even hypoplastic or no, always put a temporary clip on it because it will always be. Then I will go to the contralateral left optic to get the contralateral A1, which is the dominant one. And here it will start to appear in the field. Sorry for my fingers, it's appearing in the field. Dissecting the arachnoid from the Contralateral A1 here. So I'm getting the A1, contralateral A1. Here it is the contralateral A1. Here is the lamina terminalis. Not in every case we want to open it and readjust the lila retractors. And here is the ACOM and the annulus will appear to so, ipsilateral A1, A com, contralateral A1. And here is the cotonoid between the ipsilateral A1, A com, and ipsilateral A2. And while, while we are dissecting, we didn't see the contralateral A1 yet, the contralateral A2, sorry. Premature rupture occurred. We were preparing with the, a pilot permanent clip to put on the aneurysm but we cannot till now we can see here like the beginning of the a2 but we are not sure if it is taken in the temporary clip or not and then we put a permanent clip and we thought that we already finished and we were going to visualize the vascular thing. We didn't take the whole neck yet. So we put a temporary clip. We begin with the contralateral first, contralateral A1. And all we do this and then with the contralateral, with the ipsilateral, sorry, A1. And you always put it away from the ACOM so that you have a white field. Then you're gonna remove the permanent clip. And you can visualize the contralateral A2 will be here. Here it is. And the ipsilateral A2, and using the plates of the aneurysm, the plate of the clip to dissect between the neck of the aneurysm and the ipsilateral A2 and <laughs> Here is the contralateral A2, you can see it now. It was taken the first one. Okay, be patient. We're having some sound issues. Then we remove the clip. Then the contralateral, we remove it in here. 
then we will then we go like the hospital tree with the pigment the right of the onion the opposite control Visualization of the so, thank you, uh, Dr. Walid Abbas, for your presentation. Uh, we kind of missed the very last uh, seconds. Uh, because of, uh, of probably technical problems, but the presentation was uh, very clear. So, any question from panelists? So, uh, everyone's quiet, Alberto. <laughs> yeah, everyone is quiet. Yeah, but I I, I want to ask a question uh, to uh, Dr. Walid. Um, in ruptured aneurysms, uh, I, I was actually uh, discussing about this topic with a colleague of mine here. And uh, do you prefer blunt dissection or sharp dissection? Because some people say sharp dissection is safer. Uh, because you don't uh, mobilize too much the structures around. Some people say uh, blunt dissection is safer because you cannot see very well what you are cutting. So I would like to know your opinion about this. Uh, I always, my favorite instrument is the jewelry I always like here at night. The direct of the pattern while I'm approaching the arachnoid in the direction, not in the opposite direction. So I will not get in the animal. But sometimes I use my tools too. If I found that I pull too much, there is a risk of rupture the aneurysm, I use the micro So you have to like use both, you know. But of course I Micro dissection of the micro scissors is much easier than the jewelry forceps. But if you have to use the jewelry forceps, you have to use it very gently and in the direction of the aneurysm. Yeah. The last Dr. speaker Wally. of today's uh, webinar, Dr. Manish Garg, he's from India and he's going to talk about C1 and C2 recurrent meningioma. Uh, hello, good evening, everyone. So I am presenting this small case uh, which we which is operated last week at Benton Hospital. It is recurrent C1 C2 ventral meningioma. So basically, meningioma is the second most common intervertebral spinal tumors. Twenty-five percent of all spinal tumors here. And with ventral attachment is very challenging pathology. Spinal meningioma has very low recurrence rates. And several approach and technical modifications have been proposed for total and safe dissection of tumors. Commonly, C1 C2 meningiomas involve forearm magnum and classify within cranial cervical meningiomas. So they have benign character and significantly higher MIB1 index, but a high rate of recurrence was not observed in these tumors. Approaches are very high morbidity and so not, not justified. There is five percent recurrence rate after tumor removal. So clinical presentations they are untypical nerve duty stimulation and compression syndromes like uh, hospital neuralgia, cervical spondylitis, or scapulohumeral parathritis, among others. However, some patients are not diagnosed and until experience limb paralysis and bowel dysfunctions. Sensory disturbances are the most common symptoms during the course of progress which can be characterized by numbness of limbs, girdle sensation, and unstable walking. So relevant anatomy related to the surgical approaches of the C1, C2 ventral meningiomas. The mean settled diameters at the levels of atlas and axis are 23 and 20 millimeters respectively. 
subaxial spine, the weight diameter is only 50 millimeter. The cervical bulge of the spinal cord also begins below the axis. So all these give us the adequate space at the C1, C2 core level. So at, so at the hospital and at the levels, the facetal pillars lie anterior to the nerve roots, exiting through the interventor foramina. So these are the few for the anatomy revising, that is the pedicles, superficial facets and the lamina of C2 and C1 anterior arc, superior facets and the lateral masses with what vertebratic groups showing and the arrow. The few diagrams, again, that is after the dissection of the occipital keratomy, we can see the spinal cord and the pico region. And after the removal of the atlas and axis bone, we can see the cranial <coughs> uh, of 11 T1, C2 roots. And also the two vertebral arteries which are forming the basal artery. <coughs> now the, the posteriorly, first diagram shows the posterior approach which shows C1 and C2. And that <coughs> second diagram is posterior lateral approach which we can see there is an atlas and I see there is a C2. C2 calcium and the vertebral artery. And last one is the far lateral approach, which we see from the superior facet and the inferior facet and the vertebral artery and the C2 calcium. So basically, surgical is patient positioning. It may be prone, three-fourth prone, lateral park bench, sitting position. Each of the positions allows focusing the surgical process on the occipital condyle and the vertebral artery region. So most important in C1, C2 approach is the occipital condyle and the vertebral artery anatomy. So coming to the approaches, anterior approach and uh, basically posterior approach. Anterior approach that is transferal advantage is direct access to the tumor with no core detection. Disadvantage is later extension of the tumor cannot be assessed and higher risk of infection. Posterior approach, standard posterior bilateral anatomy with or without subosteral anatomy. Advantage are lesser risk of instability. It is one of the simplest procedure. And disadvantage, no access to estafromal tumor. Inadequate access to anterior and related tumor. So lateral approach, the lateral access, which is directed to the lateral or the craniocervical junction and includes from top to bottom, the jugular tubercle, occipital condyle, lateral mass of the atlas, and the later part of the c body. Again, the key structure in this approach is the vertebral artery which courses around the lateral wall. So the graphical representation of different approaches. If our tumor is interdural and posterior midline, the posterior approach can be done. If tumor is lateral or anterior, the posterior lateral approach can be done. If the tumor is interdural, also estradural, then posterior lateral or anterior lateral approach. If tumor is estradural only, then the again posterior lateral or Antolator approach. So this is a graphic uh, diagram. The yellow arrow shows the lateral, uh, far lateral approach, and the red arrow shows the lateral approach. So basically, lateral approach uh, we remove, we remove the uh, occipital condyle or uh, C1 or C2 medial facets. In far lateral approach, we also remove the is sometimes denser. So coming to the posterior lateral approaches, laminectomy and partial middle facectomy, advantage are no roots or vessels intervene in the path, root sacrifices, and dental uh, ligament. Sensitivity incision on the dura or contribute to the increasing the field of view in the approach. Disadvantage, extra spinal component not adequately assessed, hence weakens may occur. Polar tumor in immediate contact with vertebral assessing on the dural, all artery may not be visible. Lateral, that is far lateral transplanter approach. Advantage, direct visualization of anterior cavital junction. Removal of both extra intervertebral component facilitated. Interface between the tumor and the anterior surface of cord is well made out. Lateral opening dura avoids force factor that may cause excessive mobilization of the cord in true anterior or anterior lesions. Access to instance of the tumor above the form is possible. And post operative scaring mates is unsuitable for technical weaknesses. Disadvantage of lateral approach, need for sterilization is more than the one third of the deal, and bilateral tumors cannot be dealt with in the same setting. 
that are the literal advantage disadvantage so coming to our case which we operated last week he is a 73 year old male initially presented in 2007 with complaints of cervical dysplasia numbness all the limbs and weakness in all limbs more in the lower than upper limbs ct images and mri shows entroventral placed lesion extending from c1 to c2 lower border more on the left side attached to anterior duramater intradural extraventral lesion patient operated in 2007 and tumor was resected through post approach post operative patient recovered his symptoms and discharge and living his life normally but since last 6 months that is in from uh, around october 2019 after 13 years of first surgery he started to had gait instability weakness in lower limbs and upper limbs which was more on the left side patient was evaluated ct mri done shows recurrent lesion at c1 c2 entroventral place intradural lesion with significant compression of the cord so these are the mri images of uh, recurrent tumor which which we saw tumor is entroventral placed more on the left side around c1 c2 region so surgery is planned the first picture shows the previous incision and the second picture is which we have done ct and the, this blue region is shows the defect of the previous surgery so surgery now surgery planned more of the bone extension and so we have done some facet medial facetectomy also included so these are the picture first picture shows the tumor and the second picture shows after the tumor excision and that is the final after dural closure so these are the pre op images of the mri which shows the tumor and the post op images we can show the almost uh, that is a complete excision of the tumor and in the post images in the ct there is a c1 c1 lateral is removed and also in the c2 bilateral laminectomy plus left side medial facetectomy is removed that is a blue arrow that is showing medial facetectomy facets removed and then the, again the that image pre op image which is shows the blue area that is the area of bone defect and this post op image which shows increase our image increase so the post operatively patient doing well wheelchair ambulatory and i recovered his regularly recovering his power discussion is that the factors leading to recurrence are the young age of the patient subtotal dissection of the lesion calcification estradural attachment and multiplicity of lesions and anterior placement so conclusion is that all the spinal meningiomas are rare to recover our case implies that patient needs to be follow up and imaging should be done regularly as long as a patient is active in his life thanks Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Garg. Any question? So, how much difficult was it to get to the most anteromedial part of the tumor from a posterior approach? Anteromedial again, that posterior we have to go far later or as the far later. to the intermedial then of if we can approach the intermedial why only we have posterior foot we can't uh, yeah. the there's some more your problems on vertebra i think posterior foot can't uh, intermedial yeah probably there are some problems with connection yeah. you might be able to text that question yeah yeah or do you want to uh, try again to answer my question uh, dr garg because we had some problems here in you yeah 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 i am seeing yeah i am seeing posterior to go can't go and middle tumors we have to go far lateral or lateral or even extreme lateral so we can assess to the intermedial tumors okay so a more lateral approach as well oh, yeah, to get okay to get more intermedial more intermedial tumors mm. okay any other question okay if yeah, yeah. yeah. like low position or sitting position in the sitting position the blood will be pulling downwards it would will not be in the field not like in the prone position so what's your preference uh, 
Pardon, I, I don't hear what you have said. I'm asking, what do you prefer, the prone position or the sitting position? Do you, do you prefer the prone position yeah, or approach, sitting? In lateral approach. Uh, for tumors, we, for tumors like we, uh, the one you showed, three, three fourth uh, prone approach. We don't look generally in sitting. Okay, we didn't get probably the yes. answer. Can can you can you try again, Doctor Garg, to answer the question? Yeah. Please. Yeah, we uh, we prefer the three prone approach or three four prone approach. We not preferred sitting position. Okay, so you don't use usually the sitting position for this. Yeah, usually we don't do sitting position. Okay, do you, uh, Dr. Walid, do you have uh, experience about the uh, sitting position with these tumors? Yeah, yeah, we do the sitting position so that the field is always clear and the, the blood is on the inferior portion of the feet so we can dissect the arachnoid from around the tumor and we can cut it. We do the wrong position, but the, the feed is always bloody in such a case. Right. Okay. Gravity okay. is uh, important in this uh, in this kind of surgeries. Yes. Uh, one so. question to Dr. Ali. Uh, in sitting question, how about the CSF drainage? In the rock? Uh, do you any time feel that there is too much of CSF that drains through the spine? Uh, I can I didn't hear you. And can you just make your voice loud a little bit? Sitting question. Could you repeat question, the question, please? Uh, in cervical spinal tumor, in sitting position, what is your experience about the amount of CSF that drains out? About CSF that what? During intradural surgeries and intraarachnoid surgeries, do you feel that there is too much of CSF draining out in sitting With position? He means uh, in the sitting position, CSF can flow out. From uh, from the wound, you know, postoperatively. No, no, intraoperatively. I I think. Yes. So you probably he is mentioning about uh, uh, pneumoencephalon uh, after after surgery. So during surgery, in sitting position, of course, you have uh, more CSF uh, uh, draining out. So. So do you, do you experience of any? We didn't have a problem in that at all, even in sitting or in prone. And the most important thing at the end of the operation is tight closure of the dura. It is one of the most important things. Uh, and I want to ask about in this tumor, what do you do if when you find the, the tumor is attached to the dura? Do you get part of the dura or you just coagulate and put like a graph, suture the dura? The, this question is for Dr. Garg. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Dr. Garg, yeah, well, do, do you usually resect the implantation, the dural implantation of these meningiomas or just uh, coagulate the dura? No, uh, no, no, we generally don't use the coagulated in the spine. In the spine. If uh, we remove the Hostility, we can uh, enter later, we can uh, go there and then uh, uh, the dura and uh, enter the dura. Yeah, but I, I think uh, Dr. Walid uh, is asking if you, if you do coagulation of the implantation of the meningioma or if you actually reject the dura. Yeah, yes. yeah. For straight approach, uh, we take the dura. Take the dura. Then we, after surgery, we use dura gen or any heart closure. This is an audio nightmare. <laughs> yeah, it's a problem with uh, with audio. But I think uh, I think uh, he said uh, they replace the dura. Right. No, no. Okay. What he, he tried to say was, uh, in surgeries, what? it's fine. Coagulation is used to the minimum. And of if course, at all, yeah. there is an attachment to the dura anteriorly. If resection is possible, we go ahead with resection. And if necessary, we replace it with an artificial substitute, like a collagen substitute or an artificial dura or something like that. But in most cases, in cervical spine, I feel the coagulation is a bit risky. So, so being anterior... anterior I 
resecting of the dura will cause any problem with the seeds that leak and such so i think we can possibly so we go can and resect the possible extent of possible. the so dr walid do you coagulate or remove the dura in these uh, cases i would dissect, dissect the tumor from the dura and it's mainly according to the age of the patient if the patient is young I would like to, the attachment to the dura, I would like to remove part of it so that to prevent like as much as I can from recurrence. If the patient is, is if he is an old age patient, I would coagulate and suture the dura. It's mainly according to the age of the patient. So more aggressive for younger people, you say? For young, for young people, yes. Okay, fair enough. Okay. okay, other questions? If there are no other questions, maybe Aravind, we can close. Yes, um, this I think webinar. that there are no more questions. I think we can bring this uh, wonderful mm. webinar to an end. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I'd like to uh, thank everyone for participating and uh, thank you very much, Malesh, for all your help uh, and uh, I apologize for the tech. Just be patient. We'll get better with the connections and the sound. And uh, we're always open to televise conferences or webinars. I think we'll get, they're going to get more common now that Corona has put severe travel restrictions in the world. So the door is always open. And uh, thanks, everyone, for participating. Thank Good you day. very much. Good day, Alberto. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.